start by talking about, as, as you guys heard in the intro, I had a chance a little while ago to go visit with Guillermo at his house, Bleak House, where he keeps all kinds of crazy monsters and Frankensteins. And you have not seen that. You have not experienced it. No, I've, his... I've never been. Um, I really want to go. It sound, I mean, he talks about it like it's um, his own private Disneyland. It's, you know, um, it's, it sounds extraordinary. And um, I, I get a sense of what it's like just from working with him for four or five months and, and uh, seeing his extraordinary passion for, for all of his great loves, for, you know, he's, he's someone who finds beauty in the shadows, you know, um, and he loves gothic material, and he, he's such a collector of, um, of uh, all that stuff, so yeah, one day I hope an invitation will be in the mail. What's fascinating about him is that he surrounds himself with all this creepy stuff. Had, we have a little clip from, from that visit, do you guys want to see inside, inside the house? All right, can we play that? Is Frankenstein your favorite monster? Frankenstein's creature is, uh, to me, the most moving and beautiful monster, and it's an amazing piece of design. The house is uh, a little bit of a library. It's two houses, actually, one next to each other. I write here, I draw here, and we design some of the movies here. And I'm going to show you a little curiosity. This over here is an insect. A phasmid uh, from Malaysia that I bought when I was a teenager in New York, and uh, we ended up using it as the basis for the insect on Pan's Labyrinth. Not everybody will agree that everything's a treasure, but it's a treasure for me. But you're never scared in these houses. I, I made it a point to live with all the guys I admire: H.P. Lovecraft, Paul. No, I'm never, 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 ever, ever scared. So what I found fascinating is he is surrounded by all these creepy crawlies and monsters, and yet he himself is this delightful and very sweet man. And it seems unfathomable that he would come out, that all that kind of stuff would come out of his imagination. Was that your experience in working with yeah, him? Yeah, it's amazing when you meet him. He's su he is such a warm, generous, um, good-natured, uh, sweet, sensitive man, you know, he, and... Um, being around on set with him is a very, he's a very light, it's a very light um, and light-hearted set to be on. Um, but he, he, I think he, he's, un, he's so wise that he understands that, you know, all of our lives are a, a balance of, of the light and the dark. And I think um, he understands the place of, of um, the darker aspects of our nature and our world that make for interesting um, stories to tell in, in film um, as a reflection of, it's a safe place to reflect those, those thoughts, feelings, and um, things that happen. Uh, but it's, I, I, found, I, I genuinely found his wisdom extraordinary, extraordinary to be around. Um, and uh, Crimson Peak for him is, 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 he's poured his heart into it. Um, it's, a, it's a love song to everything he admires to the genre of gothic romance in literature and in cinema, um, to hammer horror, to um, gothic fiction, like the Bronte sisters and um, the mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe and Horace Walpole and all of this stuff that he, he dearly loves. Um, but that stuff was not necessarily familiar to you, right? You, were not, you didn't come up as a gothic romance fan, right? Not particularly. Um, it's, I mean, I was always familiar with the archetypes. I think it's impossible to grow up in England and not be. You know, <laughs> sort of, uh, um, understanding, uh, understanding that the trajectory of Gothic romance is that there is always a young, pure-hearted, innocent heroine who is drawn towards a, um, a dark stranger with a mysterious past. And, 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 and it's a, she falls in love, perhaps, or she's drawn by her sexuality towards him. And then, and he always has a crumbling mansion on the hill. And uh, you'd think they'd know better, but... Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's, you know, these were archetypes that actually, at the time, were incredibly revolutionary. You know, this was a deeply repressed time. Um, and um, especially things like... Uh, you know the sexuality of young women and and 
and uh, the darker aspects of, of our imagination were never discussed. It was not societally appropriate. And so Gothic romance was a genre that, that actually was predominantly came from women um, and was a way of exploring those themes, the, 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 the how love is a force of change and is chaotic and often dangerous and that it can impel you into situations which are terrifying. So you said you, when you approach a role, you really dive in and do a, lo a lot of research. In this case, your character is a kind of inventor. And did you study you know, 19th century, early 20th century engineering? Well, I sort of, I hasten to add, I would make it an appalling engineer. Um, uh, but I, I, the reason I do it is, is because I need to, I, feel, I always feel I need to create a, a, an imaginative context which is very rigorously built. And then I can be free in it and not, so there's a sort of, that's why I do the research is so that I can, I understand the world the director is creating. And then once I inhabit it, I can be free with my instinct and try not, because acting is really about instinct and feeling, it's not about intellect. Um, but you can't just be fringing sweely because it's not, it's a very, there's a very rigorously controlled environment. So I need to, it's almost like I need to put Guillermo's ideas on my own wallpaper and then, and then move in. He's the hero, but he's not necessarily a good guy. Do you gravitate towards people like Guillermo does who, who enjoy, who, who flourish in the shadows? Um, I think I just always love playing complicated people because I think people are complicated. Um, and I, there's part of the kind of, um, I enjoy the sort of amateur psychological investigation, if you like. I, li I like trying to find the common humanity in characters which are dangerous or unsettling. Um, and there's a turn for Thomas Sharp in the film, which I found very moving in the script. You know, he's someone who presents himself with a, an external charisma, an elegance and a sophistication. And behind that is a lot of guilt and shame. And then beneath that is a, is a vulnerability which Mia, e Edith, Mia's character, taps into. And, and out of the vulnerability, he discovers a new kind of courage, which I found very, I just found it very moving. So this movie is a gothic romance, but you've also got a couple of other films coming out, and one of which we get to hear you sing. You play Hank Williams. Yes, I do, yeah. And was it terrifying to take on something, somebody as iconic as Hank Williams like that? It was, um, it was daunting uh, initially, but that's part of the thrill of the challenge for me. Um, and um, the, thing about, the, thing, the thing I wanted to... To, to invest myself in was, was I found the screenplay so moving and music has a huge impact on my life. Um, you know, there's, a, there's that phrase, uh, the essayist Walter Pater said, all art aspires to the condition of music. I think music is the most evocative, the most immediate, the most emotional art form. And um, the more I understood about Hank Williams, the more I realized that he is a cornerstone in the landscape of American music. Without Hank, we simply, music as we know it doesn't look the same. He inspired Bob Dylan and Keith Richards and Johnny Cash and Bruce Springsteen. You ask all of those guys, you know, who's up there in the, in the, in the pantheon um, as their inspirations, and they talk about Hank. And, um, Hank, in many ways, was the first rock star, and he t and he was very poor, and he was from he was born in 1923 in Alabama, and he and he and he had um, he was very weak. He he was too weak to work on the railroad or work on the farm or or join the draft, and 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 the thing he found he was good at from a very young age was he could play the guitar, and in exchange for chore money, he was taught the guitar by this man called Rufus Payne. They used to call him T Top, a black man who taught him the blues, and. Um, and so really Hank Williams is, is someone who's, like, who's channeling this extraordinary blues tradition um, and infusing it with his own style and creating country music, or, or, or not creating it, but, but taking it on a step from Ernest Taub and, and Roy Acuff, who were the big stars at the time.
Did you, do you feel like you have a, a responsibility as a performer when you're capturing, especially, certainly when you're playing real life people, but even these moments in history which you're clearly really read up on, do you feel like you have a responsibility as a performer to tell a certain truth about that? The responsibility is huge, um, simply because I felt responsibility to his legacy, to, to, uh, to his family, um, and to all the people to whom Hank means so much. I mean, I got to Nashville. I went to Nashville six weeks ahead of shooting, and I had this extraordinary time. Um, I lived with a musician called Rodney Crowell, um, and he was my tutor in the ways of the blues. And um, just being in Nashville and understanding, you know, people come up to you and say, oh, you're playing Hank. You know, my, my granddaddy used to play these songs when I was just a wee kid on his knee. And you realize that Hank means so much um, to so many people. And so the responsibility is, is profound. Mm -hmm.